Construction has been in this rut. I call it hiring unicorns. They're a 1% guy that can handle more shit than most people you know. You can't scale hiring 1%. We were just so focused on, on the team members being safe and we didn't even realize at the time what a selling point that would be. This is a very key item for them. They don't need some bullshit on their job. They need to know that when they bring you on their project, the safety's handled. Okay, we're back. I originally planned to have Charles with me uh, just for maybe a half hour, 45 minutes, but we got into such a good conversation. We broke this into two separate parts. So I'm really excited to get us back here uh, to keep going and continue this conversation. So without further ado, we'll keep it rolling from here. Here we go. Um, one of the other key things that you have talked about a lot with me before is the systems that you've implemented and processes and how those have helped you really scale not only your team, but your internal and external capabilities, um, your customer experience, how you interact with your clients. Can you talk a little bit about some of those systems, where you got, how you put them in place, how they help you and what they, what they do for you, what they have done for you? I think systems are hypercritical in scaling a business. Now you can run a small business and you can do a few hundred thousand or a million bucks a year and you can run it all out of your brain, but you're not going to grow that much because you become the weak link. And I, hey, I've done it. I've done it. I would go, how come I can't grow this business? What's going on? Oh, wait a minute. I'm the weakest link. And I think in construction, we get, it's kind of like the snowball starts rolling down the hill and we're just kind of going down this hill and things pick up momentum and you start getting clients and you start doing work and the work keeps coming in and you're going so fast and the speed that we have to operate and this problem and this problem and this problem and this problem. And you just, I like to call it whack-a-mole. You ever played that game, you know, take the kids oh, yeah. cheese or whatever. And you got there just, you're just whacking. But really what makes a big difference as an owner or as a manager or as a, somebody that has a, a place to control what's going on is to slow down a little bit. If you let it, construction will drive you 100 miles an hour for the rest of time. You're never going to get caught up. So you have to make that pause happen. You have to create that pause, sit back, look at your business from 30,000 feet or look at your department that you manage from 30,000 feet and say, hey, what can I do? To extend my abilities as a manager or as an owner? What can I do to extend my team's abilities? And I think something that construction is really known for, and this may be, I think this section on systems is probably going to be the most critical. It's a little bit boring at times, but it's probably the most critical for your listener if they really want to make some money. And so I hope they're paying attention because this is, this is what's been really impactful for us. So you think about construction and, you know, the systems are oftentimes just lacking. We're running down that hill so fast and the momentum's going. And so we're just playing this whack-a-mole and just trying to get to the next thing. By the time you solve the next problem, boom, the other one's already popped up and boom, then the next one. And we're just trying to, uh, just trying to get to the next day. You ever felt like that, Scott? You know, just trying to get oh through God. the shit from today so I can go home, kick back for 20 minutes and then get to tomorrow morning and do that shit again. And in construction, we've got to step back a little bit, look at those problems from a higher level and find out how we can extend the team's abilities. So from what we found that slowing down a little bit is super hard to do and super valuable. So you're thinking, Oh, well, you know, I need to be out on that job site. I need to be managing. I need to be doing these things. You might actually need to just be still for a minute. You might just need to sit in your office with no noise and no phone and think about where you want to go and what things in your business you've been avoiding. I'm guilty yeah. of this. What's that big problem that's in the room that you've been pushing? I'm real busy, so I can just deal with it later. Well, then you look up and it's two or three or six years later and somebody else, they handled that problem. They kicked your ass. So we've got to take those problems. We've got to tackle them head on. So I think system creation is really critical because you want to be able to step back as an owner. I'm not trying to grind this out, taking 100 phone calls a day, playing whack-a-mole for the next 40 years. Are you? Yeah. Hell no. no. But we see people do it. I know guys that are 70 years old and they're doing everything exactly the same as they did when they were 30. And they've made some money and they've done okay. But are they at a peaceful and comfortable state in their life? No, but they could have been. And I think systems are a big part of that. So you have to step back and you have to map out how your business works. And you've got to find a way to create processes so that things don't get lost. And I, and I, I digressed a minute there. I want to go back to a point that uh, construction is, has been in this rut. And I call it hiring unicorns. And so you look at a lot of businesses and how they operate. You look at the you know, the field ops manager, or you look at, you know, that head estimator, 
maybe the project executive that runs a whole team, uh, maybe the president in a bigger organization. They're a unicorn. They're a 1% guy. They're very special in the way that their brain works. They can handle more shit than most people you know. And yep. the business hinges on them. And construction's really bad about this. You know, or that foreman, that really good foreman. He just wants to be a foreman. And that's great. He has an awesome job. And you know, that, that big project can't run without it. Well, that's a big deal. What if he's out for a week? What, what if something happens? Heaven forbid he has a, an accident and you don't have a system to accommodate information. And now your unicorn leaves and everything crumbles. So construction has got to really wake up about hiring the unicorns. You can't scale hiring 1%. There's not that many 1% guys. That's how percentage works. So you've got to be able to hire and you've got to be able to put in place good people that identify with the core values, hard workers. You can't give up on that, but you can't hire the 1% guy for every position. You've got to be able to hire maybe a, maybe they're in the 80% or the 70% or the 60% upper end of the population of, that they can follow the things that you do and they can work really hard and identify with those values. And so you've got to build a system so that that, that person can function just as well in the business. You know, the 60% person, the 80% person, the 1% person can still function just as well in the business. And I think that's what systems really do. They allow you to scale and yes, you've got to have good people, but it doesn't have to be that one unicorn that's so hard to find. And I, do you see this, Scott? Do you see this in, in the businesses that you deal with? the one unicorn or the six unicorns, maybe they're at the top end of a company, everything comes to them. And if there's a problem with them, it goes to shit. Yes, we see that all the time. Um, one of the other things systems do for you and process is it allows the one percenters you do have, it allows them to scale their department. Those one percenters, and one thing that one percenters have in common is you need to grow because they're gonna wanna do something different and they're gonna wanna grow and hire and teach and train and do the things. And you need those systems and processes to help them do exactly what you needed to do. And on top of that, one of the things we've always talked about is, you know, when you kind of hit the nail on the head is getting on top of your business instead of in your business. And one of the things we hear a lot of our business owners tell us as they've grown from maybe 1 million to three or four or 5 million, and they become essentially a unicorn running around doing everything. And it's they're they're barely home on and having everything in their head. And this is the key. One of the things they say to us is, you know, I'm getting the same paycheck right now that I had when I was a $1 million company as I am when I'm a $5 million company. Yep. And so that happens if a lot. you're listening to this and you hear this and that's you go back to listen to the systems and processes piece again, because the systems and the process are the difference between you having the same paycheck with a hundred times more stress as you grow your business or actually eliminating some of that stress while you're actually able to have a, more than just a single paycheck, same as you did when you're making, when you're only a million dollar company. People ask me a lot, well, well, how do I even start with the system? You know your business better than anybody. You know, the person at the top, I would assume, in most cases knows a little bit about each department and how it runs. You've got to think about how the information flows and you can't allow there to be a disconnect in the flow. Think about how construction goes, okay. So we've got, uh, you know, we've got Sally in accounts payable and, you know, she just gets those invoices that come in and she just knows that on, on Thursdays, you know, usually on Thursdays, she just takes that stack of paper over and she gets them approved. She just knows it. She's been doing it for 10 years. So she knows, but what if she forgets? And now you got all those suppliers don't get paid. Or, or what if you had to hire somebody else and that new person, well, they, they don't know because they haven't been doing it for 15 years. So you've got to have a process things like lists, things like flow charts, things that connect the dots so that people can go say, this information comes in, then it goes to here. And then this person checks off and it goes to here. And then it goes to here and it does this thing. And then the check's approved, it gets put in an envelope, even to that level of detail, stamped, and it gets sent out. You've got to have things delineated and defined so that you can manage them, so that you can train people for them. If you're growing, you don't need just one Sally in accounts payable. You need three because your business is going to do $100 million. And how do you scale that? How do you take all that information and document it? And so systems really are just documenting and then monitoring and managing all of those different things that happen in your company. And contracting and subcontracting, there's a lot of stuff going on. When you start breaking down the processes, oh my gosh, there's hundreds of steps to some of these things and how they happen. And, and it's the kind of work that nobody wants to do. I mean, I don't, Absolutely. you don't want to do it. It's terrible. It's the, it's not fun. It's not, it doesn't feel rewarding when you're doing it. 
Um, there's a great book for those of you that want more information on this and a tactical guide to executing this. And it's called the E-Myth Revisited yeah, by a guy named Michael Gerber. It's an excellent book. It talks all about systems and processes and scaling. It's very relatable. Um, it's not boring. It's actually a great storytelling book of how it goes from chapter to chapter. It's really, really excellent and well done. I highly recommend reading that for those of you as a quick sidebar that want to get some more detailed tactical info on systems and processes. We could probably have six 40 minute conversations about that and not give you nearly as much in that book. Can I give you an example, a story about one particular system that's massive for us? Yeah, absolutely. Please. Okay. And this is a, this was an issue I saw. I worked at a, the GC that I worked at, they do, I think they did 600 million last year, good size operation. And they didn't have a good system for pay apps. Didn't have one. It was just up to the project manager to make sure they didn't miss anything. It wasn't documented. Nobody was checking on it. If something got missed, like literally if they didn't turn in an owner pay app, there was no check and balance to make sure that happened. And we see it really, really see it in subcontracting. I mean, it's just, it's a shit show. And we're, we're built to do a lot of projects, a lot of volume. And as we continue to grow, the, the size, the average size of those jobs keeps getting bigger, but we're built to do a lot of volume. And to do that, you have to manage the information. So, and, and you know this really well, pay apps and getting all that billing done in a month, it, it, you know, at 20th, 15th to 25th, depending on what the job requires, you know, that time frame, those, you know, seven to 10 days of the month, the business hinges on that shit. You cannot screw that up. And, you know, we're doing, I think we might do 40 pay apps a month or something. And there's a lot of parts and pieces that go with those. And so we were seeing, you know, at first we created a list to make sure that every pay app got done and made sure they got done on the date. If a pay app's due, you know, got a random GC has a pay app due on the 5th. That's kind of an oddball. But if you do it on the 25th, guess what? You're screwed. It's getting pushed True. to the next 5th and you just miss 30 days worth of cash flow. Big problem. So that happens two or three times and you're like, wow, this is not something we can continue. So we make a list of all the jobs that are active and that way we check off you know, what happens. We can, you can do it in Excel. You can do it. We do web-based systems. We use monday.com because it's, uh, it, you can do it on your phone, on your computer. It's cloud-based. So everybody can see the information. It's very modular. So you can make a list, talk to another list. Uh, monday.com is really next level phenomenal for us. But the, the basic idea is you create a list of every pay app that has to be done. And, every, and then, you, then you know, um, as that pay app gets done, how much the amount was for, what the retainage is, and then that flows to the bottom line. Now you know exactly what your billing was for the month. Well, the other part was, you know, projects were not getting predicted correctly as to what was available to build during the month. And so you just get to the 20th and, okay, well, this is how much we did, so it's in the payout. That was not a proactive manner of managing the money and the cash flow. And so we started doing a, we used the same list. So the list that's got the pay apps, now that gets an analysis on the first of the month of what work is ahead of us for the next 30 days. What are we going to do? We're going to do this percentage of this, and we're going to do this many feet of this. And you just go down each job. And we're going to hit this many percentage. We're going to hit this percentage. And then you, we know on the first, by the, actually by the third, I know on the third what my billing is going to be on the 30th. So from a cash flow standpoint, now I get another extra 30 days to know what the hell's going on. And I can work with that. Also, from a field management standpoint, now our team knows, okay, well, we got these to do. Oh, whoa, whoa, we're, we're going to be a little bit short because we start dividing these up. And we know on the first that about the middle of the month, we're going to have kind of a flood of stuff to do. We need to accommodate that. We just bought a couple of extra weeks. We're not going to get that, that pissed off superintendent asking us why we're there or we're not there because we already predicted this. So that, that whole predictive proactive nature of that system <clears throat> that really allows us to move quickly. That's key. I mean, without getting those pay apps done, doing them correctly on time, not missing things, being proactive. I mean, in a world where you're paid once a month and you only have the ability to invoice once a month, if you mess it up, it, it's catastrophic. Absolutely. It could be. Yeah. I remember early, the early days of the business, Man, I, I, didn't, I don't come from any money. My dad's a firefighter. My mom's a nurse. Like we did not have any advantages. Alicia, my wife and I, we do this together and we started this from zero and almost went broke a few times uh, as we were working through things in cash flow. And that's, that's the deal. The first two or three years of the business cash flow was the deal. That was what could have made or broken us a few times in a row. And I think we're at a point now where we're able to have facilities in place to manage that, but got to manage the money coming in and coming out and a system really is the way to go. So uh, anybody that has questions, I'm here. If you, if you want to do, we could, you and I could probably do another call or a webinar actually on subcontracting systems. I think that'd probably be pretty helpful for your, uh, for your yeah. listeners. 
you know what, I'll, I'll take you up on that because that would be helpful, very helpful. If we did just a webinar purely on systems and particularly around pay apps, that would be extremely valuable. I think we're probably 30, 30 to 60 days away from having our system built to where the information flows. Listen to this. This is going to be crazy if we can make it work. I think we're close. So when the job gets sent to us as a opportunity to bid, that information goes in the, in this, uh, in the monday.com list, and then it will flow to a job that's, if we select to bid it, then it flows to another list. If we bid it, then it goes to another list to follow up on for, for sales and business development. If we win it, then it goes to another list that when we get the contract, then it goes into our contract department to do submittals, shop drawings, make sure the contract insurance is all done, all those processes. And then from there, it flows to project management. They do their review, put together a review meeting with the field team, then it flows to field. And then field knows now it's on their list. And, it, and then it flows to the calendar so they know what to schedule it over the next 24 months. And that builds into our schedule system. And then it flows to <clears throat> completion, closeouts, um, all those last items to finish up the job. And then we're done. So li literal front to back life cycle of, of the, of the project. I think we're pretty close to making it happen. It's going to be cool. That's cool too. If you can get it right from the beginning, when you first touch it, when it just isn't, when it might not even be a project. Yeah. Yeah. That is a challenge in subcontracting. You've got so many fragmented systems. You, know, you got your payroll on this system and your timekeeping on this system and you got your submittals on this system and then you're doing, well, you're probably doing changers on this one and then you got contract save over here on Dropbox and you know, it's very fragmented. So there are, there are ways to try to streamline that and make it more efficient. It's a challenge. You're now the first large subcontractor in the United States to have trained 100% of their field staff with OSHA 30 certification. I know that's something you work really hard at. You have more than 400,000 hours of work time with, with a non-event. And I'm going to knock on wood now because um, right. you worked hard on that. And, and that's across a hundred and plus employees and multiple projects and jobs. And so one, I think that's great that you've done that. I think it's a big commitment to your group. Oh, I want to recognize you for that. I think it's something that you should be really proud of. Um, what I'd like you to talk about aside from protecting people's lives and that they don't get hurt, Maybe you could talk a little bit about what that does for your, what that's done for your business. I have some ideas, but I'm wondering how that's really helped you and where you've seen some real benefits to your focus on safety. Well, this one's interesting and it kind of goes back to what I talked about earlier. I'm worried about every, everybody else's money or their safety or them in general. So I'm worried about everybody else. And ultimately I was just really worried about making sure that all of our guys get to go home safe every day. I'll tell you the story. If we have time, I'll tell you the story about how this all originated. I'll get, I get a little bit emotional because it's, it, it's, it's a tough one. So we had three guys we hired, first started the company. And two weeks after we bring them on board, one of the guys falls off a ladder. He's two rungs high. He's literally two feet off the ground. Falls off the ladder, breaks both arms, snaps them. Oh. Bones sticking out, blood everywhere. It's just catastrophic. So we go, I get the phone call. You know, they get him to the ER. I go to the ER. I had to look his wife in the eye and tell her that I was responsible because I had not trained them on ladder safety. We just like, oh, they're construction, you know, they should know. No, that's not how this worked, it's my responsibility. So I looked his wife in the eye and I told her that it was my fault and that it wouldn't happen again. And so every single day since, it's on my mind. How do I solve this? Because I'm not looking another wife in the eye and tell her that it's my fault. That shit's not happening. So wow. you think about it from that perspective, how do we elevate the safety of our team members to where this cannot happen. It's great that you've tied that desire and goal to something that impactful. Cause that's really what's made it a, turn into a positive event for you. And something that you've actually probably come through with what, uh, what I'll add to it is I'm sure from a economical perspective, you know, your insurance premiums are significantly lower. Um, that adds our insurance more company loves us. Yeah. That adds more money to your bottom line. What you do with that money then with your culture that you've built is give back to those employees and give back to the different charities you support in your community. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to not only save that money, but it's saving that money does things that are even better for those employees. So while you're focused on their safety, you're also allowing yourself and the business to be more profitable 
save costs on what otherwise are a huge expense item. The lack of worker safety can increase your insurance premiums to the point where you could go out of business. For sure. You need insurance, by the way. And now you've been able to not only create that as an opportunity to keep everybody safe, but you've made yourself more profitable and you've given back to your employees with some of those dollars to do that. So and I think that's something too. that's important. And the client. Yeah. It's definitely a selling point for us. And we probably don't push this enough only because we're, we were just so focused on, on the team members being safe. And we didn't even realize at the time what a selling point that would be. You know, you look at some of these big clients, you know, we got some of these multi-billion dollar international general contractors that we work for. Now, this is a very key item for them. In fact, it may be one of the key items for them on their list of things that they're looking for in a subcontractor. They got to have safety. They don't need some bullshit on their job. They need to know that when they bring you on their project, the safety's handled. They don't need a yeah. problem child. They just know that when Alphapex shows up, we're the safest waterproofers in America. We say that one pretty often because it's factually true. There's not another company that can match our record or our training level when it comes to safety. So I'm assuming, and I hope, that more companies will match that level because I think that will just elevate our industry as a whole. But at least for now, we definitely are the safest waterproofers in America. And that's a pretty good selling point when you know you could put guys on a job site and you could promise that GC, hey, there's not a safer company that you can hire right now. We're going to help you be better at your job. I think it's a big accomplishment, something you should be proud of. And, and I also wanted to point out for our listeners to be able to understand the importance of it, but also how it can help them as a business. Gain more customers, do a better job, be more profitable. Who would have ever tied job performance and employee safety to those other three items? And, then they, and they directly relate. So again, kudos to you, man. Yeah, thanks for that. It was a very, very expensive process. You know, you yeah. got guys, you, got, you pull them out of the field. You got it at the cost of the training, of course, but then it's the hours that they're sitting in that training that they can't be out producing revenue for the company. So it was a very expensive process. I don't think you can say safety is ever too expensive uh, because it's working. And so from that standpoint, we're very happy we had the opportunity and the idea to do it. So I, I would suggest it for everybody. It's a, it's, yeah. a big, uh, it's a big bullet to bite, but I think you should consider it. Well, to the, your point, what was two broken arms could have easily been two people dead. If it was a little higher up and a different job well, longer, if you didn't have safety protocols in place today with the type of work and the type of jobs you're doing, it could have easily been a 20 foot scaffolding instead of a two foot ladder. Right. That's a great point you bring up. Like at that time we were working on smaller projects or much smaller company, three people. And now we're working on high rises all across Texas. And yeah, yeah. That's a, a slip, trip, or fall from 33 stories up. There's no coming back from that one. Yeah. Man, this has been an awesome conversation, Charles. I really appreciate your time on this. Um, I think you uh, fit the bill perfectly, and I'm, I'm, you didn't disappoint. So thank you so much for being so open and honest and sharing all the great value you have for us and our customers and clients. Man, it was a pleasure. So thanks for uh, putting up with my monotone and my asshole nature as we work through this, just trying to make subcontracting better. You're a nice asshole. I think your wife yeah. is right. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Scott. You're welcome, man. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.